Everyone's really excited about virtual reality. The Oculus is just around the corner. I guess everyone's waiting to get them for Easter or perhaps next Christmas. And so I thought it would be interesting to kind of broaden out the discussion of virtual reality a bit and put it in context. Think about how it relates to augmented reality and a few other ideas. And so more broadly, that means introducing the topic of mixed reality. We're used to hearing about VR and AR and all these kind of buzzwords. So tell me, what, what's mixed reality? Well, yeah. To, to tell you what mixed reality is, I really need to draw you a, a picture, I think. Um, it's the only way we're going to get through this. And so um, this is a picture that was proposed by a couple of researchers called Milgram and Cascino back in the early 1990s. And they called it the uh, Reality Virtuality Continuum. Lovely name, bit of a mouthful, so I'll just call it mixed reality, if that's OK, mixed reality continuum. And if they're watching, I hope they'll forgive me. Here is the universe of mixed reality. And to understand what this line means, it's a good idea to look at the endpoints. So first of all, at this end, we'll call it physical reality or everyday reality. This is the everyday physical world. Actually, ideally, if you went back to pre-1950, no computers, no digital, okay? Just as it was. So if I put where we are now in this office, we're, we're actually kind of probably sitting here because inescapably we've got some phones and there's some digital stuff going on in the background. But at this end is broadly physical stuff. Let's get to the other end. Here's virtual reality. In the sense that virtual reality is an illusion, you're trying to give someone the sense that they have left the physical world behind and been transported into a, a digital world created by the computer and they've become immersed in this world. So that's things like Oculus Rift then, is it, at that end? I've got some cut out pictures that I carefully prepared over breakfast this morning. So let's kind of position some technologies here. Here's our soon to be friend, the Oculus Rift, that everyone's excited about. So you've got to put on a head mounted display. And so the physical world is blocked out and the digital world is introduced and you hear it as well. The head mounts have been around since mm, 70s, 80s. I'm sure someone will correct me on that. So here's an earlier picture of a head mount from sort of you know, 20 years ago. And they're wearing some data gloves that are tracking their hand movements and kind of various other things. I think it was 1994 that um, Computer Weekly was telling us that VR would be a, a mainstream phenomenon within three months. So um, to make, take, take from that what you want. And here's a simulator. This is a car sim. This is another way of doing VR. And I know you've talked about caves before on computer files. So there's all this kind of gubbins that's about getting people in a virtual world. And I'm going to position this here. So that's not right at the end then? No, it's not, is it? What would be right at the end of the line? I guess right at the end of the line would be taking your brain out of your body and putting it in a jar and wiring it into the computer directly, or possibly even turning you completely into an AI or some other sci-fi thing. So clearly you can go beyond things like the Oculus and you can have more tactile interfaces that are prodding the whole body or whatever. And in science fiction, you can imagine how you completely remove someone from the physical world. So yeah, I wouldn't quite put the Oculus at right at the end of the picture, I don't think. That's given us a sense, if you like, of the two endpoints, the two extremes. There's some interesting things that live in between those. So let's talk about another thing that, that people get very excited about. If I draw a line about halfway, then I'm going to write augmented reality on this side of the line. So why am I doing this? Because I think with augmented reality, you're trying to give people the sense that they remain in the everyday physical world, but you're introducing more and more digital stuff into that world and you're kind of overlaying it on the world as if it were connected or part of it. And how far along the line you are depends on the technology you use. So look, here's a few others. I've got this the right way up. Uh, someone will correct me. Yeah, I'll put it sideways and we're not quite sure. Here's Microsoft's HoloLens project that was talked about earlier this year, which is a see-through head-mounted display that tracks where you're looking and various other things. So it overlays the virtual world on your everyday physical experience. Let's get the Google Glass in there. There it is. I think I'd be tempted to position it a bit further along the line here. It's not quite as immersive in the digital sense. You're kind of more in the physical world. We can debate this, but you get the point. There's different levels of where you're on the line. There's other things, of course. Here's a mobile phone or a tablet that I'm holding up augmented reality style or somebody is, and it's overlaying labels about the world. So here you're kind of getting closer to physical reality, but you're kind of, you can position yourself along the line. But all of these leave you in the physical world. Where should we go next? Let's move a bit closer to physical reality and just complete the picture there. So here you start to get a bunch of other stuff. You get ubiquitous computing. I might think that what ubiquitous computing is about is more and more embedding the digital experience into the everyday physical and you end up with a, 
The latest incarnation, people are talking about the Internet of Things, for example, kind of lives in this space. You know, now your experience is really with everyday physical stuff like mugs, but those mugs contain sensors and the digital is kind of hidden within them. So you're, you're pushing the experience at this end. Now, I'm probably asking for a fight here because um, the original definition of ubiquitous computing by Mark Weiser from Xerox Park. He wrote a fair bit about how it was sort of the antithesis of virtual reality and possibly mixed reality. But maybe that's okay. I suppose I've positioned it here quite a long way from it, so, so, so maybe it is. Well, there's a gap. There's a gap kind of here, and it's interesting to think, what lives in this space then? What is it where you believe you're in a virtual world, but it's really quite connected to the physical? And this is a kind of, this is a Milgram and Cuscino's concept of augmented virtuality. I think the easiest way to think of it is it's virtual worlds that are made live. That you're in a virtual world but the digital stuff you're experiencing is driven by real events in the real world that are being sensed possibly in real time or, or something that's close enough to real time that it, it has a, a feeling of being live. So what could that look like? Well here's a few examples. This is a one from quite a long way back. One simple way of doing this is to punch video windows into the virtual world. Virtual worlds are made up of polygons with textures on them and you can make those textures be a live video and then you can essentially have a window in the world where you, you walk up to it and, and you look out and you're, you're looking into reality somewhere, in this office. Or in this case, it's a, a guy who's made his face live. So his avatar, his character's walking around the virtual world but with a video face. Yeah? So you've kind of punched a hole in virtual reality and you're looking out. Another way of doing it is essentially what Google are doing with Google Earth. So here's the Google car in that they are building a virtual world, Google Earth, that is made by scanning the real world. And although they're currently not strictly live, you know, they're, they're live-ish. I don't know what the, the refresh rate is. It's a couple of years, maybe? I don't know how often that car comes down your street. But, but they are refreshing the world, so it's on a very slow update. It's just not on frames per second, it's yeah. frames per millennia. Yeah, right? frames per decade. But as we get more and more drones or people mobile camera or whatever's going on out there, then of course that refresh rate is, is going to speed up and we'll end up with a Google Earth maybe that's much more live. And you can see some of this, some lovely videos out on the internet that show things like plane data coming out. You can see these over Europe and you can see, you know, it's still not real time, but you get a sense that if you could track planes as they were flying, you would actually see the journeys that are being made right now or, or whatever. I think augmented virtuality perhaps doesn't feel quite with us yet, but you can see some early glimpses of, of where we might end up in this spectrum. So there's another kind of bit we can, we can fill in. We've drawn the picture. This is, the, if you like, the universe of mixed reality. A lot of the technologies and certainly the underlying software techniques are actually quite similar here. A lot of these involve being able to track people's movements and head positions and objects in a world. A lot of them use graphics in different ways. Even the devices are quite common and we see headsets on both sides of the line, but it's whether you can kind of see through them or not. You know, I think that things like augmented reality and virtual reality are not really different things. What they are is different experiences of the same thing, which is mixed reality. It's tempting to think that you're in you know, just one of these. You're either doing augmented reality, I've got my phone out, or I'm doing virtual reality, I've got my Oculus on. But actually there are experiences that mix them up and move between them in really interesting ways. Um, so for example, uh, back in the noughties, a group of artists called Blast Theory made a, a really lovely game uh, in which you could play it in, in two ways. There were a bunch of people who were on the streets of a a city running around and they had handheld devices that showed them a kind of a live map of where other people were in this game and they were tracked with GPS and then there was a bunch of players who were online in a virtual model of the same city so they were logged in over the internet um, and they could see where the people on the streets were and the people on the streets could see where they were and then the two of them had a game of chase basically the people on the streets chased these people and as they went um, audio streams were captured from the people on the city and they kind of went out to the, the online players. And the fun here, if you were an online player, was again, it was a nice example of augmented virtuality. You could tune in to the sounds of this person running through the city so you could hear the traffic and you could hear them being out of breath. And then you could figure out things like, okay, the right game tactic is to work out where the hills are. And if my avatar runs up the hill, which doesn't hurt me at all, this poor sucker's gonna be laboring and I'll hear it and, and so on. So that's a lovely example of an experience that deliberately mixes up these. 
And also you could head out of game territory and think about other situations. So let's think about, um, so my colleagues have worked on um, emergency and disaster management, where you've got a big command and control problem. So with disaster management, you've got people on the ground, yeah, out there in the field who are trying to rescue people or you know, solve problems, wearing whatever they've got, handheld devices or possibly even kind of heads up displays. But also you've got people back at base in a control room who are, are trying to coordinate, get an overview of the effort. So you know, any, that kind of command and control situation is a, a classic example of where you probably want to mix augmented virtuality and augmented reality in, in some kind of more flexible way. Stealth and botnets usually go hand in hand because from the point of view of a CNC server it wants to ensure... And some years ago it seems the NSA got a backdoor in one of these routers, presumably because they got one of their people to get a job.